I'm just going to bring up game designer Will Wright, and we'll have a conversation. Come on up, Will. Welcome. Thank you. You get the couch, and I get the therapist chair. Oh, how comfy. All cool. right, and this is where the questions are going to come in, so I have to hit refresh every so often. I'm trying to multitask here. Okay. <clears throat> so, Will, you, uh, you've been designing uh, games for 25 years. Now. Yeah, don't say that. That makes I, me sound old. Well, I, <laughs> I just did the math. Um, I realized that I've been writing articles about technology for 25 years, so we're both so old, we're both old, old yeah. guys. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're the last gen. <laughs> Uh, your, your latest uh, uh, creation was Spore, um, and that came out uh, September of 08, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell me, you know, Spore was sort of a departure. Tell me what it was that, that made it a departure and, and how you feel the, the project went. Well, I think each one of our projects kind of builds on what we've learned from projects before that. Uh, with The Sims, we had seen this tremendous interest in the players wanting to come in and modify the experience, share things they'd created in the game, but they really had to go to external tools, and then they had to post stuff on websites, and there was a lot of friction moving these creations back and forth between the players. So with Spore, we wanted to give players higher leverage tools so that in a few you know, minutes, they could create you know, amazing characters, buildings, worlds. But then we wanted to also make that part of the gameplay, so we weren't leaving the game to make this stuff. And we wanted, more importantly, the uh, sharing of this stuff to be transparent so that all you're doing is playing the game, but while you're making stuff in the game, it's sending stuff up to our server, which is kind of automatically being downloaded to fill other players' worlds. And once we had that, we were able to basically kind of promote this toy galaxy of millions of unique worlds that was continually being kind of refreshed uh, asynchronously from the server. So in some sense, it was an asynchronous multiplayer game based upon user-generated content. Did you, were you, I mean, there was, Spore was one of the most hotly anticipated games ever. Um, and, but the response to it right when it came out, people started playing it, was all the things you said were extraordinary, this idea of, of, of creating. As a matter of fact, you told me on the phone earlier, something like 100 million user-generated. Yeah, we have 100, around 100 million user-generated assets. Which is, you know, is extraordinary. Players. But are, are, you, are you pleased with the continuity or continuance of the gameplay? Because I think some folks felt like that was extraordinary, the building of that, but then yeah, we How do we then get into the rest of the world? From the hardcore gamers that the games weren't deep enough. Uh, you know, in some sense, Spore was all along intended to be almost more of a toy. I think that we have kind of certain preconceptions of what a computer game is. And, you know, I would prefer to really build toys that are more accessible to a broader group. We had a lot of the same criticism around The Sims. Uh -huh. uh, you know, just some withering criticism that, you know, why in the world would I want to play a game where I'm taking out the trash and cleaning the toilet? You know, what's <laughs> fun about that? You know, games are supposed to be about fantasy where I save the world. Uh, but yet we found, you know, this new group of people that are coming in and playing games are interested in games that are a bit more personal, mm -hmm. uh, where they really, you know, the game revolves around them, not just what they've done in the game, but what they've created in the game. Uh, but also, for a lot of these players, the game slowly turns into a tool of self-expression. You know, a lot of Sims players, they'll play the game itself for, you know, a few weeks, but then they start making stuff, and they start telling stories that they can post on the web. And, uh, you know, some of the things they're making, like the Machinima movies that they're making are extraordinary. Right. And these are people that would never think to pick up a video camera and go out and shoot a movie, but by getting kind of mastery over these uh, kind of tools that are within the game, then the tools become the main point of value for them. With Spore, you know, we're actually looking at building a lot of other experiences off the data sets that people have made, uh, you know, there's 100 million assets, uh, taking that into a lot of different directions. And we've even put up an API so that players have access to that database, and they can actually build their own applications pulling the data out of there. Oh, that's cool. So Spore is sort of an open platform that might, might evolve into something that you never imagined. Yeah, so Spore, the game, is like one instance of what you can do with that data set. I think the data set is really the valuable part. You know, right. and the fact that the data set is really its community asset. You know, it was built by millions of players playing this game. And we're hoping that they actually find really interesting things to do with the data set. So I don't want to be all controlling on this data set. In some sense, I want this data set you know, to really be the nexus of the community. And Spore of the Game is kind of one aspect of that, one spoke on that. Let me ask you the question that we can ask and get it over with, because I think that the philosophy that you're talking about there is very you know, consistent with the philosophy of, of Web 2, generally, mm -hmm. this idea of creating a platform. Data is the intel inside and so on. Um, but there was a huge outcry, at least amongst a, a very you know, vocal 
group of people about the, the, the digital rights management around SPORE. The copy protection, yeah. Yeah, the copy protection. Um, did, did, were you surprised by that? Did you learn anything from that? I think we were surprised by that. I mean, it was really kind of a corporate decision as to how they were going to approach the whole copy protection issue and the DRM at the time seemed like a reasonable solution. Uh, basically, the users informed us that it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> in fact, EA yeah, just announced that they've kind of rescinded that and they uh, have a patch now where you can remove the DRM. So that goes into the category of corporate learning. But this is something that uh, I've dealt with ever since I started doing games back in the early 80s. You know, copy protection was a huge deal back then as yep. well. And I've seen the effects of it. I've seen, you know, the effects as a consumer and as a producer of the content. And there's no easy answer. You know, I think really it's going to be social standards and, you know, access to this stuff in a way where it's not impairing the experience. Because these people are paying a lot of money for a game, and you don't want to be crippling, the, you know, treating them basically as criminals uh, just because of the piracy issue. So right. I, I think it's going to be a continual kind of annealment around different solution sets. Right, right. How much do you find as a designer your work is, you know, blue sky thinking about what could, could be? And how much are you constrained or are you at all by the business model and the business considerations that you have to keep in mind? Well, I'd say they're what I would consider the real business considerations, which is, are you making something of value for a large number of people? Uh, you know, frequently you get into like kind of the political business considerations. Can I pitch this successfully? Can I get marketing to buy off on it? What are the forecasts going to be? You know, but at the end of the day, as a designer, I feel like it's my responsibility to create something that a large number of people will spend a lot of time, you know, enjoying. So. I think that any designer, that's part of the you know, design problem that they face, is really understanding, you know, is this something that I can communicate uh, to a broad number of people? And you have to communicate that, you know, it, it can't just build a fun game. You have to build the concept of a fun game that you can communicate before they ever buy it. You know, when somebody goes into a store and they see a box sitting on the shelf, they look at the box and they're actually playing your game at that point. They're actually looking at the box and starting to run a little version in their imagination of what that game is. If that game in their imagination is fun, they might go pick up the box and turn it over and read the back of the box and build a more detailed simulation in their head of what the game's like. And so now they're playing version 2.0 of your game, but they still haven't installed it. So as a designer, I think you have to kind of think through all of that as well. Well, now, so let's talk about a different design frame then, because the, the idea of the box and the shelf have, have really shifted in the past five years to the you know, download of a, of, of a trial oh, yeah. and the interaction. How has, the, how has the, the move to distribution on the web and as, spo as, you, as you integrated with Spore, the, 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 the use of the internet as a platform for the game and for creating new possibilities for the game, how has that shifted the way that you think about designing games? Well, those are kind of two separate questions, really. There's how do we make use of the web in these experiences, and then there's kind of the web as a distribution mechanism for these games, which, uh, you know, like a lot of technologies, there's this, you know, maybe 10-year lag between when everybody starts talking about digital distribution. I remember CD-ROM. People were talking about CD-ROM, how great CD-ROM was going to be. And there was this long lag when nothing happened, and then about seven or eight years into it, all of a sudden, every computer had a CD-ROM, and everything was just, you know, so this very rapid transition. I think in the area of uh, games and stuff, we are just about to hit that rapid transition. We've been talking about digital distribution for years and years and years, and just now are we getting all the infrastructure necessary for that to become a practical reality. That is going to change our business tremendously. Uh, in terms of how you use that, I think the social connection that games are using on the net is going to be critical. And it's not just multiplayer games. People tend to think of World of Warcraft or synchronous multiplayer games. I think there are a lot of different dimensions to that. Spore is, in fact, an asynchronous multiplayer game, or as we call it, a massively single-player game. You're not actually playing head-to-head -head against other players, but yet your world is populated by the creations of millions of other people. Massively single-player. Yeah. I mean, you are basically God in your universe. And, you know, there are a lot of design constraints that whenever you do a multiplayer head-to-head uh, -head game, mm -hmm. you can't let any one player get super powerful. You can't let anybody cheat. You can't let anybody pause the game. Uh, these are kind of major design constraints. So we were looking at this new space that nobody had really explored, which was, what if we get tr the benefits of millions of people building these worlds collectively, but yet every person can still be kind of the king of the hill in their own installation of the game on their hard drive? So we're kind of there are a lot of hybrids, I think, between what we think of as multiplayer games and single-player games. And I think we're just scratching the surface of what those might be. So what do you make of the lessons, and this is a question I'm kind of getting out of the, my peripheral vision here, but what, do you, what lessons do you take from Second Life? 
which for a, a year or so sort of was the Twitter of, I don't know, 2006. Oh. Um, and, and then just seemed to, I mean, the still has this very hardcore group of people who really enjoy it, but it didn't, never it seemed to live up to the expectations. Were you watching that? Yeah, and, very and closely. I mean, in fact, Second Life was just, you know, the last version of many previous examples, Alpha World, way back. Right, Alpha A very sure. similar thing. People yeah. could create this world, move around. You know, these aren't really games so much as they're platforms. Uh, I think that they're interesting data points towards something that I'm not exactly sure what the destination is. I like the fact that uh, in Second Life, in fact, the players could craft fairly elaborate objects, including, you know, elements of behavior, but the uh, sophistication, sophistication that you had to approach those tools with was pretty high. So it was a very limited percentage of people that were actually creating meaningfully interesting objects. Uh, and I think that's one of the holy grails that we're looking for. Right now, with Spore, we were able to give players very advanced tools to create amazing content in terms of creatures and models and stuff, but they're still not actually programming the behavior at the algorithmic right. level. Is that something you'd like to do? Oh, it's something that we've been looking at doing for you know, at least 15 years. And I've followed so many different experimental you know, kind of attempts to do that in the educational arena, in the entertainment arena. The, uh, it's a hard problem, though. I mean, because at the end of the day, if you're going to give somebody a Turing complete language, they really have to know how to program. Right. And for a lot of people, programming does not sound like entertainment. Right. We're selling entertainment. Right. Uh, but I think that we are going to find ways to give people access to that in safe ways. So even if 1% of your players can program stuff, and it's of value to the other 99%, uh, that's a huge win. And so I think that's a hill that we are just very, very slowly climbing, but it's a very steep hill. Yeah. So Talk to me a little bit about how you see, uh, for example, there was a YouTube integration with Spore, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about what you might see, more, you know, more of these kinds of integrations in terms of, of existing web, and I think this might be very interesting to this audience, uh, particularly those who are uh, creating and designing web environments. How do they integrate gaming in, and is there going to be a, an ability to, to sort of to, to have a component or a module that, that, that speaks to gaming that is part of... Even I'm not sure I would distinguish way. gaming in that dimension because, you know, I think one of my kind of central premises in designing games is that most people are very narcissistic. Uh, the more you can make the game about that person, the more interested, more emotionally involved they will get. Well, isn't that also true, say, of Amazon? I mean, yeah, you know, your it is. recommendations, your store, people like you also bought. The whole web thing. I mean, when you think about it, you know, people like the idea of communicating and crafting their own identity. Uh, before kind of the technology that we have now came around, people did that with their choice of their wardrobe or what kind of car they drove or the kind of house they lived. You know, when I met you, I would, you know, immediately assume certain things about you from what you're wearing or where you live, what's in your house. Uh, nowadays, people are crafting more and more of their identity on the web. And it's a much lower friction. You, know, you don't really have to have a lot of money to create a really you know, dense web presence, a really elaborate one. It can also say a lot more about who you really are. If you're really about you know, protecting the endangered ring-tailed lemurs, uh, you're not going to communicate that to me through your wardrobe, probably. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> on the web, though, you know, I go to your Facebook page, whatever, right. and you know, you can, I can very clearly find out the things that you're passionately interested in very readily. And so I think the whole concept of social networking, you know, and when you think about a social network on the web, you are always the center of the social network, right? It's not, in fact, the social network of everybody in the United States or even your community. It's, you know, here's you at the center, and everything flows out from you, which is pretty much our perspective on the world. You know, we are at the center of our experience. So I think that. Uh, the web technologies are allowing people to think about their identity and how you communicate that in a vastly different way. And we're now starting to see kind of overlap between that virtual identity and real identities. So that things like Facebook, you know, if I look at my friends, they're mostly people that really know me and I meet in real life. And they can go to my Facebook page and meet other people maybe in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think we're right at the verge of where I can hold up my cell phone and point it at you and bring up your online social network profile, even if I've never met you. I mean, we have the technology pretty much almost yeah. available now. So I think the intersection of these virtual identities that we've been crafting and experimenting with is starting to intersect and collide with kind of our real face-to-face -face identities in the real world in an interesting way. I think games are going to be an aspect of that. They're going to be one possible dimension of your personality. Well, are you considering designing games that integrate that? In other words, the game might lay on top of the idea of, of that Sensor action. I mean, we've been talking yeah. about sensor. I, I'm much more interested nowadays in the idea of games that intersect the real world 
uh, rather than you just go sit in front of the computer and craft and live in this whole fantasy environment. Because I think we are getting to the point where we realize games are a very powerful motivational force. Games are a very interesting kind of lens to view reality through. Uh, they're a filter, like a map in some sense. Mm -hmm. They can help us understand complex systems in ways that very few tools can. So I think the idea also that you can bring a game and map it onto reality serves the aspect of people want things to be about themselves. And the more this game can be about me and my real life and my real experiences and where I really live, my real friends, the more interesting and involving that game is going to be rather than I'm going to go in the game and become an orc and maybe get a good sword. So does this mean that um, we might expect some games that integrate some of these aspects coming from from your studios sometime soon? Well, just in general, these are the ideas that interest me right now that I'm finding myself spending most of my time thinking about. You know, how do we kind of move in this direction? And I'm kind of more talking about a, a general direction. But I think this is an intersection of both, you know, technological trends and social trends right. as well. So let me ask you another question, and, and, and um, maybe I'm just overly fascinated with business models, but this seems <laughs> to be a question that, that is on a lot of people's mind because when I play Guitar Hero or any number of other games, I'm now seeing buckets of KFC on the ping pong table. I'm seeing AT&T logos, you know, on the wide pan before the band shows up. Yeah. Do you expect to see uh, commercial integration? Because after all, if you're talking about brands, people make brands part of who they are, and, and it's part of their. Oh, they definitely are. Yeah. Know? I mean, kind they're part of the drive. conversation of our community, right? So, mm -hmm. do do you see that integrated into future releases of Spore or any other? You know, is that model something that you see creeping in, and do you have a negative or a positive reaction to that? It's interesting, because I think that that model, and we've experimented with it a little bit. We had some stuff in The Sims Online where we had a McDonald's object you could buy and uh, a couple others, an Intel computer. And I think you can craft those things to where they are voluntary and a point of value on the consumer. If I, you know, if I really want to play Grand Theft Auto and see you know, real franchises on the street as I drive by, and it makes the world seem more real, uh, that seems... It's seen as a net benefit you know, to players. If it's something that you're pushing on them that actually breaks them out of the experience and is obviously uh, for commercial purposes rather than the detail and familiarity of the world, right. then players react very badly to it. So it's a very brittle, you know, very fine line you have to kind of walk down that path. You know, I think that uh, commercialization attempts, you know, how we monetize entertainment properties is in a really interesting experimental space. You know, I think we're kind of going through this almost Cambrian explosion of you know, evolutionary approaches, trying lots of different things. You yeah. know, what's happening in Asia right now, there's always been a huge piracy problem in Asia. And the only way to really make games in Asia is if you have a monetization model online, and typically based on microtransactions. Right. And the thought is that basically these models are going to be deployed to the rest of the world eventually, pretty soon. And so even in America, we're starting to experiment with the idea of the game is free, but the stuff you buy in the game you know, via microtransactions is how they monetize it. Right. And so I think we're going to start seeing uh, all of the above, basically. We're still going to have AAA titles you know, that you buy either digitally distributed or brick and mortar for 40 bucks. But we're also going to have a lot of gaming experiences, you know, even right now, that you can kind of experience on the web that are monetized over microtransactions or ad-supported. So I'd like to ask you about a few uh, big shifts or big developments in, in, in sort of the at least orthogonal part of gaming that maybe you, I'm sure you're thinking about designing for or maybe already have. And, and first of all, tell me what you think about the Wii and, and, and basically the idea of a sort of, you know, biometric or a, you know, a, a motion-based uh, input. Sensor. I think the Wii is very cool in a number of directions. You know, one of the big problems we've had in games is the asymmetry between the output. When you look at the amount of data coming out of the monitor and the speakers, it's tremendous compared to the input, which is typically via you know, a mouse or joystick or keyboard. The Wii actually has a fairly you know, decent bandwidth on the controller, but it, more importantly, it's an instinctually mapped bandwidth. Uh, to play tennis, I don't have to remember these weird button combos. I just pick it up and swing it like a tennis racket, which also makes it accessible to a huge group of people who are really intimidated by a controller with 16 buttons. And so we basically left a huge amount of our potential audience in the dust without realizing that we're kind of complexifying the threshold to get into a game, even for the first two minutes. So there's that aspect of it, but there's also the aspect that I think is even more important, which is that we, to me, represents the idea of non-immersive gaming. We used to think of like the best games are the games that are the most immersive. I really dive into this. I live in the monitor. The world around me ceases to exist as I'm playing the game. That's what we kind of call immersive gaming. When you think about the Wii, and you, you know, you're sitting in a room with your friends playing the Wii, 
most of the entertainment is not happening on the screen. It's watching your friend, you know, act like a goofus swinging the thing around, you know, <laughs> maybe throwing it through the TV set. Uh, the same with things like, you know, a Guitar Hero or Rock Band. Most of the entertainment is off the screen. It's in the social group around you. So basically, you're breaking away from this idea of an immersive game and into a game where you're actually, you know, cognizant of the things happening around you. I think that's just the first step. You know, I think we're starting to see mobile games now on handheld platforms. Yeah, I was going to ask you your view of the iPhone in particular as a... Yeah, well, I mean, the, the very first games on that were basically, you know, simple versions of games where you sit there and stare at the screen and get lost in the game. I think we're starting to see more and more games where, you know, where you are matters. And, you know, this is going to, I think, eventually get toward the idea of augmented reality, where the world around you is now the play field for the game. You can map things on top of that world, play games, but again, it's the intersection of the real world and the virtual world that gets really interesting compared to me just sitting there playing a little game, you know, on the subway. So, um, I, I'm getting a, a lot of questions that are quite similar, and I want to I want to give you guys, you know, it's clear that everyone wants to know what's next after Spore and after and Sims. Like, what are the both? What's the next step for both those franchises? Oh well, you know, Spore and the Sims are being driven more and more, I think, by the players. And, you know, we found this when we did the very first Sims. We came out with an expansion pack, and then we were watching what players were doing with the game and the expansion pack, and they were hitting brick walls in certain areas to give us suggestions. And so, really, the expansion packs for the Sims were ways for us to incrementally add to the game uh, in the directions that players were pulling it, you know. So, in some sense, it's kind of like Frankenstein, where we spend all of our time sewing up this monster, we flip the switch, then it gets up off the table and it gets out of our control and walks around, and who knows where it goes. It crashes through the wall. And that's what the players are doing, you know. So in some sense, they grab these franchises and they start steering them, you know, probably more than we are. We're at this point responding to them. And so the same thing with Spore. We're actually looking at things that players are doing with Spore. We're planning a lot of, a broad range of applications around Spore, other game experiences, but some, you know, things where you're just taking the content and doing funny stuff, putting it on your Facebook page, or playing a more casual game with it. So uh, at this point, I'd say this is almost more the new model for me in game development, is that really the initial game is there to spark and build a core community. And then you really have to listen to that community and get them very involved, get a lot of buy-in on that community yeah. on where you take the franchise going forward. That's cool. Um, a question about, <clears throat> I think gaming has always held a lot of promise, but I don't know how much it's paid off in terms of being a force for education and, and for training and for, you know, and we're in a period of time now where there's an entire workforce that you know sort of needs to be re-educated. Yeah. Um, particularly folks who who have been in industrial jobs. Do you see a, a role for gaming there? And is this something that you personally or that your companies have been involved in in terms of using gaming to help re-educate or educate? And I'll just go back to one quote that I remember when I was editing Wired in 1994, and that shows you again how old we are. Um, you said that you, you know, you, we did a piece on education, and I remember editing this piece because there was a quote in it from you in which you said that you really abhorred the approach that public education was taking to schooling, um, and that you couldn't wait for the Nintendo generation to grow up and become teachers. So that was yeah. 50, 15 Which is years ago. Right it's just starting to happen. Yeah. So give me a little bit of your views on, on education and how you think gaming might fit into that. Well, it's funny, because when you use the word education, I'm hearing a very dysfunctional concept of what we really you know, should be calling you know, making people better at dealing with the world. You know, whether it's general problem solving, skill sets, motivation, whatever, there are a lot of kind of aspects to that. Uh, when you look at a typical computer game and you hand it to a kid, like a seven or eight year old, it's interesting because what they do is they just start pressing buttons randomly and they look at what happens on the screen. They start building a model in their head very rapidly, a hypothesis over, oh, I see that button makes them jump, that button makes them move. And they're, in fact, totally exhibiting the scientific method. It's hypothesis, experiment, Look at the result, refine the hypothesis. And so kids are able to approach something with the complexity of a game and reverse engineer these horrendously complex mental models of what's under the hood of a game just through the scientific method. So in that sense, I think games are already orienting kids to be general problem solvers. Now, uh, you know, we tend to think of education as something that is reflected in standardized testing. The type of things that games are really good at teaching are things that are very resistant to the idea of standardized testing. And so I think that there has always been this weird kind of uh, tension between the idea of education and play. But really, when you think about why do we play, 
or what even we do storytelling, these are both educational technologies. You know, they evolved to be fun for us for a reason. And we can look at other animals, other mammals, and they play. And obviously, it has an educational component. So really, the reason why we find play enjoyable is for educational reasons. You know, our culture tends to kind of shy away and say, oh, play is disposable, wasted time. It's not education. Uh, but there's another aspect of this, which is that there's an old quote that I really like, which is, uh, education is not the filling of a pail, but the sparking of a fire. If you get somebody really interested in a subject, they have plenty of opportunities to learn about that. You know, every kid, in essence, has the Library of Congress, actually quite a bit more than that, on their desktop in their bedroom in the form of the internet. If you get a kid really interested in a subject, try to prevent them from learning it. You know, there's no way. Uh, so really, I think what I'm more interested in is how do I get kids motivated, not how do I educate them. I think education is a process that once you get a kid motivated, it, you can just get out of their way and they can educate themselves. You know, some of the smartest people I know, the things that they are really brilliant in were all things that they basically learned on their own. Right. Uh, so I think standardized education can only bring you so far. To become truly excellent at something, uh, you have to spark that fire and then let somebody pursue it kind of in their own terms. Right, right. Now, um, I want to ask you one more question. Maybe it goes back a little bit to some of the other things we were talking about because it has a bit to do with the web. But it's the number one question up here, and I absolutely want to honor it because there's a voting system, so people oh, voted I this see. up. Uh, and this, this is, uh, you know, has to do with, uh, I think, a theme of certainly of this conference over the last few years. We've always, and there's even a conference that O'Reilly does called Where 2.0, which is about location and, and, mm -hmm. and mapping. What, what do you make of, of, of that trend and the fact that, you know, now with Google Earth and, and, and Microsoft uh, Virtual Earth and, and so on, the ability to take literally the world and, and turn it into data and then feed that into gameplay? Is that something that, uh, you know, we were talking about social networks before, but what do you make of that trend and, and are you thinking about adding that into, for example, the SimCity franchise? Well, I think SimCity or something like Google Earth really are ways to take uh, data sets and event streams, uh, timelines, that are way outside of our perceptual range and make them manageable. We're basically compressing these down, things down to little models and toys that we can wrap our mind around. And, you know, a game like SimCity, you can actually play through many decades. Typically, you go out and look at a city, it seems like this static thing that's just sitting there. If you have speed it up in time, it becomes very organic. It looks mm -hmm. like a cell. It has circulatory systems and all this stuff. And so really, it's a matter of taking that, you know, long time span, compressing it into an hour so that now we can map it into our instincts and we can start to understand how complex. And we start seeing rhythms and patterns that we would never see over the long time scale. So I think this is where the value of toys is, and models, and simulations, and games, is how do we take the complexity of the world, filter out parts of it, compress other parts of it, so that it very naturally maps into our instincts, and our perceptions, and our senses. So, and this is also part of the intersection, I think, between kind of these virtual worlds and the real world. You know, the more that we can take the real world, compress it into these simulations, models, and toys, and make it into a playful environment. So now I can start play, hypothesize, think about these things in totally different ways. Uh, we can have totally different understandings of these things. And, you know, to me, that is real education. The fact that, you know, we can take this complexity and put it into a form that we can now digest with our brains. So in some sense, I really think, you know, we are a cybernetic organism right now. You know, the computer is enhancing our perceptual systems uh, so that our brain can now understand systems in brand new ways. Well, that's kind of a good note to stop on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, no, I mean, that, that, that's very interesting. I, 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 we're, we're out of time and I'm getting flashed at, but I, I, I'm curious, just a thought came to me. Given what you just said, um, have you been contacted by dark organizations within the government? <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be a yes. Um, well, Will, we are out of time, and I want to stay on time. Thank you so much for spending a half an hour talking with us here. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it.